So I kind of love that they did that and hate that they did that because now it's an impossible standard to live up to. Um, but again, I'm Matthew. Hi, nice to meet you. I have taught here before, but this is the first time teaching since my wife and I made the decision, uh, which we made back in actually in January to move back to Bowling Green. So it's a joy to be with you. We don't actually move until June 12th. So, so far, we don't yet know where we're living, and we haven't packed a single thing. So we're doing really well on the, on the moving thing. Um, but we'll figure that out, I think, I hope. Um, actually, I kind of gave a teaser in the first service, and I didn't finish it. So I'm just going to say it now so I don't forget it. We actually have a, an accepted offer on a house in Bowling Green, finally, after months of looking. So it's not, no, wait, no, not yet. Hold on. It's not, we got inspection, appraisal, all that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to not jinx it, although we don't really believe in that. So shame on me for saying that. But potentially, we have found a house. We'll see uh, in the next couple of weeks how it plays out. So excited to be here. Tiffany and the kids are not with me because we have made the trip back and forth, BG to Kent, which is two and a half hours, a miserable turnpike drive. And we've done it like five or six times in the last month, and it's insane. So they're back in Kent. Um, probably packing, right? Um, actually not, <laughs> definitely not. Um, so uh, we're in this series called uh, The Hall of Faith. Uh, we're actually ironically doing the same exact series back in Kent, and I got to introduce the series a few weeks back. Um, so we're studying the same thing in our churches, not on purpose, but on accident. Um, and kind of the big idea of what I want to talk about today is that true faith is about our hearts and not our actions. Matthew's going to fix me. Okay, so faith is one of those words that is so deeply embedded in the, in the culture of the church that I, honestly I worry that we maybe don't know what it means and we struggle to know what it looks like. Um, it's one of those words that I, I, I call certain words slippery, and I feel like faith is one of those slippery words. Um, and one of the, the things I, I love about having friends and family members that are not Christians is that they just ask you like the most basic fundamental questions like what does it mean to have faith and how is it that you believe that Jesus was God how is it that you believe and have faith that the way that you're living your life the choices that you're making are going to turn out in the end and these kind of really simple questions that often come from people that don't share our faith usually leave us kind of going like, well, I guess I just believe it, uh, you know, because it's, it's hard. hard. Dif- faith is really difficult to try to explain to someone, and it's even harder to live, right? Um, I think we find ourselves sometimes really wanting and choosing to live by faith, and other times swinging the pendulum all the way over to like, what do I have to do to just get by, keep God happy, and leave my heart out of it? Can I just do this and not really have to be moved or changed in any way? Um, and, and I think we struggle with faith, and it's fitting that we're in Hebrews because actually the author of the book of Hebrews is writing to a group of people who are struggling just like we do. Um, in chapter 2, verse 1 of Hebrews, the author says, Pay attention lest you drift from the gospel. From chapter 3, verse 12, he says, take care lest you develop an unbelieving heart. In chapter 5, he says, you've stopped even trying to understand what this following Jesus thing is. They are struggling just like we do today. Their story is our story. We drift, we go cold, we check out. Why? Because it's really hard to live by faith. It's just simply hard. And yet we find ourselves in these situations in our lives over and over again where there's this opportunity that we have to choose to live by faith. And you can probably think of moments in the past, uh, maybe even as, as recent as today, or maybe this past week where you were presented an opportunity where you could choose to do something that would require faith, that would be stepping out and trusting in God, 
for your desires, for your future, for the unseen, for something that you need. And you either chose to do that or you found a way to kind of sidestep it. And so when we find ourselves in these situations and it's a struggle to choose to walk in faith, what do we do? What's the remedy for that? To live a life where we're consistently choosing to step out and walk with God in faith. And there are no easy answers. I'm not here to try to sell you on like, here's the simple quick fix. But one of the things that we see consistently throughout scripture is that God commands us to remember. And I know that sounds like really passive, like we should be doing stuff, not sitting and just thinking about the past. But that's exactly what God commands his people throughout all of scripture is to remember. Remember that God throughout all of history has been faithful to his people. He has never once broken his promise. He has delivered his people from far worse things than what you may be going through right now, or at least equally as difficult of things that you are going through right now. God is faithful. Remember that. We have this amazing record of all the ways that he has done that throughout human history. The author of Hebrews takes all of chapter 11, and he just kind of parades out these dozen or so people who embodied faith. Who it, it, It's not even so much about them as it is the stories of the way that God met those people and provided for them and transformed them. So you get Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Joseph, Rahab, on and on and on. All of these people embody faith, and, it, and it's not actually even about them. It points us to God. And what the author of Hebrews ultimately does is he says there in the beginning of chapter 12 that it's really just all about Jesus, that each of these people that we're going to study in this series anticipates, points us in the direction of, leads us to Jesus who would have the faith in full that these people demonstrated in part. I think there are two reasons why the author of Hebrews would do that. I think the first is just this simple reminder that we need to hear that we are not alone in this struggle for faith, this difficult having to choose in different circumstances throughout our lives to go the path that's harder to step out and risk in faith. We, we're not the first people to do that. We're not alone. Generation after generation after generation, men and women have done this and sometimes not done this. And so we relate to them in their struggle and we look to them for encouragement in their victories that God won for them. And the second reason I think that we do that is because we discover what true faith looks like. I'm convinced in the best possible way, the best way that we discover that is through people who live by it. It is a slippery word. It's hard to explain. You know, it's even the definition that's offered in Hebrews is kind of confusing and hard to understand. It's about being confident about things that we hope for and things that we can't see. And I'm not discrediting those things, but I think for those of us who struggle, we just have to see it. We need to encounter the people who live by it. And so, so much of my spiritual development is just me ripping off things that I've seen other people do. And so I remember as uh, someone new coming around to the church way back in the day, there's this guy named Jason Slack, who's actually now one of my co-pastors in Kent. And he would talk about how he'd have this structure of like, every day I spend 30 minutes in devotion. Every week, I spend four hours in devotion as an extended devotional time. Once a month, I do an entire day of devotion. And then twice a year, I go on like this overnight getaway with God. And I'm like this 22-year-old guy that wants to like change the world and be a church planner. And I didn't do any of that stuff. And I was like, what? What's he going to talk about with God for two days straight? Honestly, what, what is he going to do? All that time, and I was skeptical, and he was just like, yeah, you should do that. You can come with me. Let's do that together. We, we won't talk to each other. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you at all during it, but you can come with me. And I was like, all right, I'll just, I look up to you. I respect you, so I'll try that. And that's become a discipline in my life that I wish I could say I do perfectly. 
I don't, but I've tried to maintain that kind of rigor when it comes to pursuing God. I know that I need it, so I try to do that. I remember uh, Eric Asp, who's, I'm talking about my Kent co-pastors, if you haven't noticed, um, choosing to leave this city and this church way back in the day to go plant a church in the Netherlands, in the city of Amsterdam. <laughs> this kid who grew up in a cornfield on a farm in a town of like 100 people choosing to move to the most populated, one of the most populated cities in Europe, this postmodern, secularized city, this dude from a cornfield was going to go and bring the gospel there. And, and I remember watching that from afar and thinking, maybe I could go on staff. Maybe I could do ministry. Um, maybe I could share the gospel with my family and with the people around me. I, I'm just convinced that we see it. And when we see it in people, we, we know it, we can identify it, and then we can imitate it. Um, I think about this all the time with my kids. Um, how much of an impact that Tiffany and I are having on their lives right now. It won't always be that way, but they're young. They're nine down to one. And their faith formation is right now so intertwined with us. And we do family devotionals. We, we do them every night. We, we have a dance party. And then we do family devos, only Christian music, only the most, you know, um, worship music, just joking. Um, Sometimes a few words pass through, and we're like, got to explain that to the kids now. Um, but we have dance parties, and then we go right in, into devotional time. That's usually when our kids really start acting the worst and being the most disobedient. But okay, we're just going to roll with it. We do devotions. That's important to us. We pray uh, before every meal as a family. We have this thing where we go lay with the kids in their beds at night, and we talk to them. We're trying to have spiritual conversation and getting them to connect the dots when Phoebe talks about how this girl out at recess hurt her feelings, and we try to bring God into that and say, well, God, what's God maybe want to teach you? What, what does he think about that, and how does he want to care for you? That kind of stuff. So our, be <laughs> our bedtime routine is like two hours long. It's, it's a problem. Um, we're trying to tighten it up, but we just love, like, we get it. That is our, like, that's important, and all that stuff is super valuable, but I'm convinced that more than anything, the way that we're influencing our kids is they're just watching the decisions that we make. They're watching the way that we talk, the way that we spend our time, the way that we use our money. They, they're, as they get older, they're seeing that. And it's affecting them. And we hope and pray that we're bearing witness to the power of the gospel as we do it. This process of choosing to move from Kent, the city that we love so, so, so very much, and these people that we love, has been like our faith is on display for our kids to see. <laughs> um, and honestly, sometimes our lack of faith is on display for them to see too. Our kids ask the best questions. Um, Here's a sampling. I tried to be as literal as like word to word as possible. Um, oftentimes in my journal, I'll write like the stuff that my kids ask me. So this is as close as I can get to some of the questions that my kids have been asking me and asking Tiffany and I uh, over the last few months as we talk about moving to Bowling Green. You can see their struggle to understand faith. How do you know? Like, how do you really know that God wants us to move? Mason asks us that almost every day. Mason is like the, the, the kid I will struggle to relate with because he's going to be an engineer or a mathematician, and I don't have that brain at all. He just wants to know, how do you know? How can you be so convinced that God would want us to move? Aren't your best friends here in Kent? Why would we leave them? What if you don't like your new job? Why isn't God giving us a house yet? Are you and mommy sure, really sure, that you heard it correctly? That's, <laughs> that's another Mason question. He's so articulate. Um, why is Brian Wiles' head so shiny? 
that's a Naomi question. Um, there is like this awesome, truly awesome weight that we feel as we parent these kids to embody the kind of faith that we hope to see in them both now and for all the days of their lives. And the fun part is occasionally they get it. And we'll hear Mason and Phoebe hanging out. Uh, read, Mason will read books to Phoebe and Naomi at, at night, and then they'll get into these conversations. And Tiffany and I are like listening right outside the door, and they'll ta- they're talking about moving with each other. And we'll hear Phoebe say things like, it's okay because even in the hard times, God will be with us. And, uh, and we just sit out there and weep in the hallway. Um, Mason's the doubter and Phoebe tries to speak truth. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so as we go to Hebrews 11 and we look at the life of Abel, we're asking, what does Abel teach us about faith? How does Abel embody faith? And then how does he point us forward to Jesus? the author and perfecter of our faith. So, so Hebrews chapter 11, this is common in Hebrews 11, we get one verse on the person that we're talking about in the hall of faith. So Hebrews 11 verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, He still speaks. I love that Abel is included in the hall of faith, but if I'm really blatantly honest with you, I struggle to know why of all the choices, this guy that we get so little info on back in the book of Genesis. Um, Most of us, if we've heard of Abel, we just know him as the dude who got killed by his brother right? Cain and Abel. Um, And that was a big deal. That was the very first death recorded in scripture. Did you know that? The very first death, the most unnatural thing for us, who are made in the image of an eternal God, it came by way of a murder. Um, That's a big deal, but that's actually not what Hebrews 11 is talking about. Hebrews 11 is focused on the offering that Abel made. And so we don't get a ton of details in Genesis 4 either, but we have to go there. Um, What we see is one of the very first acts of worship. Um, So go with me to Genesis chapter 4. I'll read verses 1 and 2. We'll kind of go through it slowly. I'll make some comments along the way. Genesis 4 verses 1 and 2. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. So Cain is the firstborn. Again, this is all at the very, 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 very beginning of things. But what we do know in that culture and ancient society is that the firstborn was the prized one, was heavily favored. And when Cain was born, Eve says something. She at least says something. When Abel is born, we get nothing. In fact, Abel's name means like vapor or breath that vanishes. So the story is written in a way where we're thinking Cain is the main attraction. Cain is really where it's at. He becomes a farmer, which again, in, at least as time went on, that is the far more admirable profession to have than being a shepherd. Shepherd's kind of the lowest of the low. We go to verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. Now, we don't, we don't actually know why these guys are making an offering for sure. We have nothing yet in, by Genesis 4 that tells us that God had set up a system of sacrifice. This is not, we're not to Leviticus yet where all that stuff gets spelled out. So maybe that has happened, maybe it hasn't happened. We don't know. What we do know is that these guys are worshiping. Whether it's just by instinct, because we are inescapably worshipful people. It doesn't matter if you go to church, it doesn't matter if Jesus is Lord of your life. We worship by nature something, someone. So I don't know if it's by instinct or maybe God had communicating, communicated something to them, but they worship. And remember, we're in a fallen world. The curse 
is in effect. Sin has entered the world through Adam and Eve, and yet these guys are worshiping. Verse 4, second half of verse 4. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. This is huge. This is huge. This is not what you would expect. Cain should be the favored one. Cain should be the one doing everything right. And it should be Abel who's doing everything wrong. That's not how it happened. This is the crux of the story. This is the main attraction. This is where Hebrews 11 comes from. And this is why Abel is in the hall of faith. We'll get to that in a second, though. Look at the rest of the story. Verses 6 through 8. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And that's how the story ends. But as I read this, the question that just is in my mind that drives me nuts is why does God not accept Cain's offering? Why does he take Abel's but not take Cain's? Is he playing favorites? What is happening in this story? And, and I've learned that over the years, like it's often in the most confusing, head-scratching, we don't understand this parts of Scripture, that if we sit with it, we, un- we uncover amazing truths. And God is up to something, even in those confusing things. So why? Why accept Abel's offering, but not Cain's? Was it because Abel's was from an animal, and so blood was shed, which we know was really important when you get to the book of Leviticus? Maybe. That's possible, but we don't know for sure. Um, God just really likes barbecue, so he wants the meats. Bring me the meats. Um, I don't know. Um, to me, I'm like, well, Abel's a, sh- uh, a shepherd. It makes sense. He has access to land. So, yeah, he would bring that. And Cain is a farmer. So Cain brought what made sense for him, and Abel brought what made sense for him. I don't know. Maybe that's what's happening. Maybe it's not. Was it because Cain brought, like, the nasty throwaway produce that you never want to buy when you go to Walmart? Um, Maybe. I, we, we actually, we just don't know. It doesn't give us that information. And so we can get frustrated, and yet we need to press into that confusion. Because if God's word is his word for us for all of time, it's, if it's his gift that he has passed down throughout generation for us, if it's authoritative, if it's sufficient, then we have to at least wonder, is there a reason why this isn't crystal clear? Is something else going on here, and I'm convinced it is, because regardless of the why, why Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was not, at the end of the day, what we know is that the answer is not something that we can see with our eyes. Cain's problem was not the content of his offering, but the content of his heart. I'm going to say that again. Cain's problem was not the content of his offering, but the content of his heart. And we know that from Hebrews 11, because Hebrews 11 commends Abel for his faith. And so by comparison, we get nothing like that on Cain. God is entirely more interested in our hearts, in the content of our hearts, than he is in what we bring to him. Does worship matter? Yes. Does obedience matter? Yes. Does sacrifice matter? Yes. To the extent that those things render our hearts more fully abandoned to God. To the extent that they make us love God and want God more than anything else. They're not just empty offerings. God does not need our gifts. I know that is so basic and so fundamental, but I need to remind myself of this all the time. God doesn't need Whatever it is that I'm offering to him, whatever it is that I'm sacrificing, he doesn't need it. He wants our hearts. Mason, our our nine-year-old, I'm going to talk a ton about my kids. Just brace yourself. This is what I do when I get on stage. So 
Uh, Mason, our, our nine-year-old, used to do this thing where he'd get in trouble, and he would run up to his room and slam his door. And after about a half an hour to an hour, he would come downstairs with his head kind of down, and he would drop like two or three dollar bills on the kitchen table, and then he'd go back upstairs. And I'm like, sweet, I need that. Uh, extra blow money for me, yay. Dave Rams would be happy. Um, he wouldn't say a word. He did not exhibit an ounce of repentance. I mean, something was happening. He, he just brought money down. And he was operating in this kind of transactional, like, I know I did something wrong. Here, here you go. And then tomorrow I'm going to do the exact same thing. And that's what he did. And the next day he'd do the same thing, bring some money down. I'm like, sweet, this is starting to add up. And if, if we weren't so committed to this whole grace thing, I could have made some decent money by taking all of my son's birthday money. Um, but I, I didn't do it. I, we always gave it back to him. But there's this sense in which his heart was not engaged. He was not repentant. He didn't want to change. He just wanted to do what he needed to do. He wanted to do the, quote, right thing. He wanted to do kind of the religious thing and pay for his sins. And so he'd drop a little money on the kitchen table. And I wonder in my own life and in all, all of our lives if we do that a little bit with God. If we go through, we do our stuff, our hearts aren't engaged. We're not actually repentant. Our hearts are not soft and tender. They don't want the things of God. We just want to get by and do what we have to do and keep God off our back. But the whole system, the whole sacrificial system that God would install soon after Cain and Abel was a way of making his people true worshipers. The whole point was to render their hearts to worship. It was to tra trans transform them and change them and cause them to trust God more than anything or anyone else. Abel had something that Cain did not. And Hebrews 11 tells us it was faith. Cain brought his offering in faith, or Abel brought his offering in faith and Cain did not. Abel's heart was tender. He was truly worshiping. He brought, we get detail with Abel, he brought the most, the firstborn and the fat portions and that signifies, signals something about his heart. Guys, God has always, always, always been after our hearts. He's after our hearts. He's not after our religiosity. He's not after our rule keeping. No amount of that stuff will change the fact that what God wants to do is to make you more and more like Jesus for the sake of this world. That is what he is after. Remember David in Psalm 51 after he's sinned with Bathsheba? And he says, right, that, like, God, you, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. David got it. That it's not about what we bring, but the bringing of whatever that is that God is asking of us signifies that our hearts belong to him. That's the scandal. That's the scandal of our faith. That you can do all the right things, that you can appear on the outside to be morally upright, that you can be seen by people around you as super religious, and yet entirely miss God and be offending God in the process. Isn't that a terrifying thought? That you can miss God as you're doing all these things for God. The Bible spills a ton of ink warning us against us, against this very thing. I can write my tithe check with a bitter, angry heart. I can love my neighbor with a self-righteous heart. Look at me, how great I am. I can do ministry with a self-glorifying heart. I want attention. I want people to notice me. I want people to comment about me and how great I am. I can serve my wife with a self-serving heart. I'm going to do this so then she'll serve me. We don't know exactly what was going on in Cain's heart, but God could see it. And it rendered his offering unacceptable. And he sees our hearts too. That 
is a terrifying thought. God sees everything that's happening inside of you, spoken or unspoken. He knows the motivation of our hearts in everything that we do. Isn't that wild and crazy? Like, I feel like we need to resurrect the fear of God in the church today. And when I think about the fact that God knows my every thought, I'm immediately fearful, and I think all the right ways. He knows our hearts. By the way, just a clarifier, I'm not suggesting that we don't do anything until our hearts are perfect. You will never do anything. You'll be utterly stationary if you wait until your hearts are pure. We live in a fallen world. We are a cursed people. We're always going to have fractured motives. We're not waiting. But what, what we are doing is that we're doing these things so that our hearts will change. So that we will learn to trust God, have more faith in him, live our lives for him in increasing measure. I think if we're honest with ourselves, our intentions are rarely ever that pure. In fact, there are times in my life where I'm just like, God, how can I do this in a way where my heart is just not engaged? I don't want you to ask me for anything else. I don't want to ask. I want you to ask me to make this about you. I just want to do this because I know I'm supposed to do it. And let's get it over with. <laughs> can you relate to that? What happens when that faithlessness gets exposed by God and we realize that there are these things that we're doing that appear righteous on the outside that are just tarnished, these impure motives. Do our hearts soften or do they go hard like Cain's did? Do we turn in humble repentance or do we run and pout and hide like Cain did? Hebrews 11 says that Abel still speaks today, and here's what I think he's telling us. I think he's telling us, purify your hearts. Do what God is asking you to do, but do it with a sense of true, genuine worship. I think Abel is imploring us to not forget about God as we do these things for God. He's reminding us that what matters is the content of our hearts, not the content of of our worship. So I wonder where you are today. Has genuine faith, has this like real, tangible, visceral hunger for like, Jesus, I just want to live for you. I want to offer you whatever you ask for me. I want to be made more like Jesus no matter what, no matter how hard this might be. I want to step out and live by faith. Has that been, not because you intended it, but it just hasn't become religious rule keeping. God's somehow been pushed out and absent. Honestly, I want us to assess our hearts today. Hebrews 12, as I get ready to close, says that Jesus' blood speaks an even better word than Abel's. Abel's blood cried out for justice and for vengeance. And Jesus' blood cries out for mercy. Upon mercy, upon mercy, for grace, for forgiveness, for second chances for the opportunity to be made right with God. Jesus' blood is an invitation to have our hard hearts that have forgotten God be made tender again. Because when we look at the cross and we look at our crucified king and we think God put on skin, came to earth, went silently to the cross, died for us, rose again for us, when we see that, our hearts melt. And it makes perfect sense that at the end of this list of people in Hebrews 11, the author would then go to Hebrews chapter 12, and he would say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. It was joy that led Jesus to endure the cross, the joy of being obedient to the Father, and the joy of seeing you and I be made right, to know and walk with our God again. And when we see that, and we fix our eyes on that, the hardness of our hearts, the way that we forget God, the way that we push God out, it all gets melted away when we look at Jesus. And so my prayer for you today is that you would honestly assess your hearts and ask God to reveal if you're somehow missing him and that you might encounter his unending mercy for you, that you might catch a glimpse of him and 
melt into worship. Even in Cain's sin, as the story goes on, God protected him. He didn't allow anyone to kill him. He put a mark on him and kept him safe. This is our God, guys. He is more generous than we can imagine. He's more kind. He's more patient. He's more loving than we can ever imagine. And when we fix our eyes on him, we don't just do religious stuff. What happens is we end up wanting him more than anything else. And I pray that that's what God would do in you today by the power of his spirit. Let's ask him to do that now.